Oh, it's official now. <laughs> um, I just got out of the shower. I'm drinking some coffee from Portland in a really nice mug by local ceramics artist. And uh, Yvonne is joining us live from Paris. And he's setting up his Zoom right now. And so, Yvonne, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Then you, you can hear me, Ron, right? Yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay. So, I'm, uh, this is, unfortunately, this is not the morning. So, it's already 7 p.m. here. I wish I would be in bed at this time, <laughs> but I'm in, the, I'm in my studio, uh, so I'm hosting in my studio. I have this big space for some time, and, uh, and I have a space where I work, but I'm also hosting an um, exhibition with Brazilian artists that react to, um, to the government in Brazil and the like, horrible policies they're like, doing, and we just finished a conference where I was the mediator. I was part of the conference, like three minutes ago, we were in a conference. And then I'm gonna just give you a little tour of this is my my space and where there's some works around. And then there's the exhibition with Brazilian artists and there's people here around. Uh, and uh, so that's, and that the conference was over there. And, um, so it's a very, very uh, like, I'm very happy of hosting all this project because it's being very crazy and we had a lot of press and people comes every day, but it's the way I spent my Sundays lately, just <laughs> <laughs> in, as a kind of uh, managing this studio slash small institution of, because the plan is to make an uh, an art like a space for a Latin American artists, so we can invite different Latin American artists to make exhibitions here in Paris. And what, what part of Paris are you in right now? Okay, so we are in the north. Oh, uh, we're in the north um, of Paris. This is Pantin, mm -hmm. which is the the pure north, um, just a few blocks away from the limit of the what is called. Intramuros, inner Paris. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of close to the city center. And then the, where, the place, it's uh, just these gigantic warehouses. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go away and show you a little bit more. Okay. This um, huge so warehouse. All, that, all of this yeah. is your, your studio that now you're making into a gallery as well? Yeah, I'm going to show you a little bit around. So this warehouse is just gigantic and there is like some other ones like this. And uh, my studio, it's about uh, from this area plus this area plus this area plus that area. And, uh, and so basically I built this space as a place where to show my work and to install it and to take pictures of it and stuff. And then this is more like a construction place. Now there is some works in display, these bridges, uh, uh, there's kisses, there's two tongues that are kissing. This, can, we, uh, can you see the, uh, the bridge? Sure. That was this like is, the one we had here at ASU. Totally, totally. So these are kind of dirty because they were installed in London during last summer. So it's the poem, you can read my walking, me and while you're walking. Mm -hmm. This place had no name, then it had many, then it won't. And then it continues like this. Uh, I installed like this, it's an old series of photos, but I just, I printed this year. It's a series of erotic pictures I made in, in the Metropolitan Museum. I spent almost a month doing this kind of uh, erotic pictures all around the sculptures. There is some other pictures here, I don't know if you guys know. These interventions I made oh, in right. monuments right. with the ponchos, where like make Spanish kings wear like South American ponchos. Uh, these are more like this kind of small poem texts I I make. This is like way more than alive. And then there's some other works here in preparation, some concrete that has been casting. There's like a stock around here, the, some antipodos, kind of a smaller scale similar to those which are also in Phoenix. Right, that's a very small scale compared to what we had. Yeah, <laughs> and then I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you just, uh, I'm gonna show my face so you 
again. Mm. And uh, I'm going to go next next uh, to the next warehouse because it's uh, we have also they allow me to. So at this space is like there's like 20 artists working here. And uh, so I have this kind of corner, which is already big. Mm -hmm. And then there is another warehouse, which is gigantic. It's the, by the biggest warehouse I've ever seen in my life. It used to be a metal, a tube, like a tube factory yeah. um, back in the days. And sadly, it's going to get destroyed soon. Mm -hmm. We're going to switch the camera again. Wait. So it's this wow. huge warehouse. It's them. It's yeah. It's really amazing, and a uh, pretty good rave there as well. Yeah, well, they do some Pre -COVID. events sometimes. <laughs> they do some events sometimes, but it's not open all the time to the public. Hmm. And they allow me to make this installation. This is an installation. It's called the Other Me and the Others, mm -hmm. and uh, as you will see, it's actually a seesaw. It's like a collective seesaw. It's like the game. Right. Of CISO, but I'm, I'm going to go up. And you, you sent me you... a picture of this with the Brazilian artist. How many people ah, fit yeah. in that? Oh, you can be like 50. 50. So you can play in a group. And then I don't know if you will notice, but it's going to move. It moves. Make this little. No, you cannot notice much. So it really, it really balances. And if you go one side to another, and the idea is to point out this idea of like we are all connected mm -hmm. and then every movement you do affects the others so i think we're all connected in real life and like everything we do in our lives it's kind of influence the other but once you're in the platform it's very literal because as soon as someone goes in you have to decide how to behave how to interact with others and every move you make affects the the other's position and where did you have this displayed last i sh uh, wish i showed this in um Son Quatre, which is an it's like an art center but they also host a lot of dance and theater um, events in so france? it's uh, and it, it, in france in paris yeah and uh and the good thing is also that's where all the kind of b-boys and like street dancers go to practice Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a place it's a like a it's a huge place, and but it's also full of bodies. It's like always people like rehearsing their dance on some even like more like um, circus stuff, you know, like uh, yeah, like playing with things and fire. <laughs> yeah, well, not I don't know if fire is allowed, but no, okay, sort of. But it was beautiful also because uh, it was a lot. It was used a lot, so mm. it, it stayed in display for uh, six months. And then the idea was to bring it to South America to make a little tour, but it, it like kind of the, because of mm. the this year oh, has right. never happened. So, yeah, I mean, speaking of this year, so many things have changed since we saw you last. I and know. I also my, my haircut. You told us that your family actually we're having coffee in Arizona right now. But um, can you tell us about your family's uh, business farm? Oh yeah, coffee. true. Uh, so my, I have, um, a lot of aunts. My father comes from, uh, they were 12 and there were three, three boys and three men and, and nine women. And, uh, and they have this, I mean, my, my, most of my aunts stay in the little town. They, they, my father was born in this little town named, uh, like Geneva, oh no, Genova, like Gen Genoa. Mm -hmm. um, Colombia. In Colombia, yeah, in the Andes, in the south of Colombia, close to Ecuador. This this is the outside of the warehouses. That it's also part of the. I'm gonna go to the office. Okay. <laughs> and and uh, and so my my most of my aunts remain. They still live in the in this little town. It's actually very little. It's maybe as big as this place. Mm. <laughs> and uh, and most of my aunts always uh, grow coffee. That was the kind of not family business. It was just they grow coffee for it was a local thing. It's not that they made a, like a real business out of that, and it was like more quite normal there. They they had their they brought their own coffee and they made enough coffee to sell a little bit and so. But they're very modest and uh, and actually also beautiful. And then now 
for uh, I think three, four years, one of my cousins, a bit older than me, he he got in touch by chance, coincidence with mm -hmm. some people in Holland, and then he told them, yeah, well, my family, as I might say, my family grows coffee since forever, and it's a coffee that it grows in in mountains that are kind of high, so it's called high altitude coffee. Mm -hmm. And they were like, okay, well, we'd like to try it, and they were like, okay. And it ends up being like a super good quality coffee. So now they start this company named Argote Coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and so and tell then us, be, yeah. what's one of your um, first childhood memories in Colombia? Oh, wow. Uh, well, in Colombia, I grew up, I, I, lo I forgot the key on the other side. The, the bad <laughs> thing is like, it's far. <laughs> uh, I, well, I grew up in Bogota and then my parents, they're both, both teachers. Mm -hmm. And um, my father always, he was, yeah, I mean, he was a, a proper teacher, but he never worked much as a teacher because he was a unionist and like a more like a politician. So we grew up in a kind of popular neighborhood in a, uh, kind of in the suburbs, I kind mm -hmm. of, yeah, it's like a poor neighborhood. We were like a very modest family. Um, and uh, I, when, <laughs> no, I remember, no, I grew up in, a, in like in, a, in the projects and then I had this life. It was a kind of bit of wide life. I remember when I first saw, wrote uh, Tom Sawyer, I had, the, I had the feeling like I had a life like that when I was a kid. So yeah. I had many adventures uh, because in those days, like where I was living, there was kind of the, some part of the city end there so there was like some just fields sometimes and we used to go like make adventures go through the fields to another neighborhood there was a neighbor a neighborhood more like middle class nearby and sometimes mm -hmm. you went to see like <laughs> supermarkets because we yeah, were like like uh, the life there right. uh, even sometimes to steal a little bit <laughs> so I was, I learned, like, it was hood a bit. So I learned how to open cars, how to, uh, mm. uh, we didn't do, like, real bad stuff, but uh, right. it was part of the, the neighborhood life. Yeah, it was interesting because when I was growing up, our uncle taught me and my brother and cousins to be master thieves. So he would <laughs> just had to steal things for him that he needed from a store. In exchange, he would take us to see Lucha Libre. On Saturday. No, really. So, so we paid you back. <laughs> um, I have a question for you here. Yeah. Can you describe your family in three words? Uh, um, engaged, engagement. Let's say. Engagement. Uh -huh. Um. Uh, tender. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, political. <laughs> that uh, um, so you have this term radical tenderness that you use in your work to talk about your work can you talk a little bit about what that means to you now in this COVID era um, well the, this I also it's nice also you mentioned my family because um, my mother is this, it's this teacher and she directs schools and like um, high school, let's say like public schools. And mm -hmm. she created once this project named uh, the Festival of Affection. So he got so many schools of the city together, teachers uh, mainly, and also some students to talk about, to stop like for a week, the normal program and to talk about um, uh, affection. So it's something that is not usually, uh, Mentioning in school, let's say, mm -hmm. like in a normal school, let's say, let's talk about our emotions, let's talk about love, let's talk about, and then that was, I was, I don't know, I was in university at the time, and then it was very inspiring for me. Um, and then their whole experience, they started like as a radical, they were like radical lefties back in the 70s, and little by little, they were like having more responsibility, and then start doing a lot of more projects. My father is like an elected guy in the city of Bogota. Um, and uh and then with time and the way also the way they raised us i we understood that there was this thing of you can be critic you can be uh, uh contestatarian you can criticize uh 
then you need to go and into the aggression. You don't need to uh, enter into that field. Um, so when I talk about these you know, these issues of tenderness, radical tenderness, affection, mm -hmm. and everything, I, I really believe there's a way to transform and to criticize and to make strong statements without playing the game of of being aggressive. Without because actually that serves the other. That serves the extremists, the populists. They use that that anger that mm -hmm. we sometimes have to like respond with more strong with more authoritarianism with more uh, force right so i believe we need to find a way to uh, not create that reaction and then make possible and say out loud things without uh, playing their game mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's why i i like to use it and it sounds a bit provocative and could sometimes sounds a bit naive but I don't mind. I think I, I really believe it's uh, it's important. And so you grew up with the family, with education, and how did you get interested in art? Um, I was not. Uh, um, I mean, I I never had um, artists in my family. I never had. I never went to museums with my family. I never. I know. I was not close to that. I was. Let's say my parents and as militants, we were more. Uh, I was more influenced by like say music like political music or um, their text lectures and stuff and then um, when I was in university I decided to study graphic design at the beginning because I wanted to do animations I wanted that was my when I was 16 I started university at 16 and I finished at 21 and then at 21 when I finished I was more interested I got interested already in some uh, conceptual art it was uh, i remember dan graham was a very important figure for me even mm -hmm. if i was not in an art faculty i was uh, i learned i made also like a cinema school and i was more interested in these video installations he made and and then i finished university and I started working in, in the advertising as a filmmaker assistant very young doing the advertising and then i had the idea to study maybe philosophy because i was interested also a lot in some philosophers and really this idea of thinking and creating thinking for creating questions was interesting for me. Uh, but then I, I found in the art that it's a, it's a place where I could do that with not necessarily with language, but also with images, mm -hmm. with actions, with objects, with situations, with installations in the public space, not necessarily like in my sphere, not necessarily writing, not necessarily in the kind of intellectual world. So that's why I decided to, uh, I, I got a prize uh, in a, I, I made a, I applied for an exhibition in Colombia of young artists, and then I ended up winning the, the main prize of this kind of group show. Mm -hmm. The prize was a ticket, uh, whatever I wanted to go. And then I, I had the time to think about where, um, where, to, where, where to go. Uh, and so I made economists in the advertising and I decided to come here and study art. Yeah with this idea, like using this as a philosophical tool. So Paris was the destination. Yeah, I choose Paris. I didn't, I never left Colombia before. I never traveled. We never traveled outside Colombia ever. So I had just this image like, okay, it's very central in Europe. In If I, if I like it, then, then uh, it's, it's nice. If I can't stay or I cannot get into school, I'm going to make a trip all around Europe and come back to Colombia and then... But but then I got into school here, and then kind of I started doing my life as an adult here. Mm -hmm. How long have like you been sort of adult? <laughs> I've been fourteen years now. Fourteen years. Wow. Yeah. Let um, me find my so, key because yeah, find your keys. I lost. Um, Kat, do you wanna? Um, not everyone saw Ivan's show. I believe that is in the in the Zoom. But can we show some of his work from the ACR Museum? We're going to show a couple of images from your show here. Okay, Ivan. cool. I found the key. <laughs> Says art. <laughs> so here are a couple of images from Ivan's exhibition, Juntos. And this actually was his first um, solo museum show in the United States. And okay. we're really honored to have him create new work for us. And we also had his first uh, film and video retrospective as well. 
So it's a combination of videos, films, um, sculpture in the project. So this is, uh, I can comment on that or not? Yes, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> uh, so in this, in this space, that it was also very interesting because uh, I never got the chance to show all this. I, a bit of my, my work is uh, made in video and a big part also is this short format video that I made in like, yeah, this. Uh, it was like interventions I make in the statues or uh, in sometimes, for example, in this other video on the left, I'm asking a, uh, a group of people in an elevator, in a big elevator in the subway, and tell them I'm, it's my birthday and then I'm new in Paris, I don't have any friends, so I ask them to please sing the birthday song for me. And they actually accept, even if Parisians have this reputation of being very mean. So in, and in one minute, uh, the whole elevator with like 50 people became kind of this small party. So there is the, uh, there is a series of many series of videos and I've shown that in the past many times, but never since they're like one of my first works. I don't show them much recently because most of the times I get invited to make kind of new productions, new shows. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was a very, I mean, like I was very also of course honored to have a first show, uh, institutional show in Phoenix, in ASU, but also to show these videos together because I'm like emotionally also attached to them. Kat, do we have the video of Yvonne's birthday in Phoenix? Can we play that for a second? So last time we saw Yvonne, he came here to do a series of youth protest workshops. And one of them was at a local elementary school in Phoenix. And it happened to be his birthday. So <laughs> True. Can you video? I thought it was really sweet to share your birthday with 30 uh, fourth graders. Theory, yeah. And here are a couple of images from the uh, workshop at the ASU Art Museum as well the following day. <laughs> so cute. This, uh, this is a, a, a project I've been doing for uh, now nine years. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the first basically, one was in Spain, right? The first one was like outside Paris, yeah, in Ivry, in a museum named Magval. And, um, and since then, I've, I've been doing like in every time I have a show, every time I got invited to a, uh, sometimes even group shows, sometimes biennial, sometimes film festivals, I try to make one of these workshops. And it's basically a a workshop for it's like a protest workshop for children in between four and eight years uh, old and uh, so th th it's a uh, first part that is very interesting is they we work together so they can generate their own slogans and it's mm -hmm. basically um, a workshop of critical thinking so what do you like what do you don't like what you like to change from their own perspective we don't tell them what to say or what to talk about but it's so they can say like sleep more to be less tired or I hate vegetables or they're allowed to say everything uh, or cheese like someone <laughs> and and, um, and then we encourage them to go I mean we make these banners and we encourage them to go and like say out loud in the public space their questions their their opinions mm -hmm. um, so it's a it's this idea of a critical thinking workshop that also it becomes a place where to kind of empower their voices in the public space and also with this idea that the public space is very I don't know you say that in English coercive or uh, 
doesn't allow you you're not allowed to do many things you're not allowed to uh, to touch it almost even to modify it public space is untouchable you don't you don't you're not supposed to right mm -hmm. and i think it's a really unfair because it's uh it's our space it uh, belongs to every one of us mm -hmm. and if you're respectful enough you'll be a uh, allowed to just create modifications to change a bit the reality of that public space that is so mm, untouchable so it just mm. gives this public space mm. what are three things people or artists or groups that inspire you right now um what i have to say um well, in from one side, I'm the, the experience we're having with the Brazilian show, and, mm -hmm. and it's very intense. And then right. there is a lot of very young artists who are like uh, not in school. So, for example, this artist named Liz Paraíso, uh, she's uh, she she arrives ten days ago from Brazil, but she she started working in Brazil, and she's a sculptor. She's a very young uh, transgender artist who makes this um, kind of sculptures in metal and she mixes also with kind of jewelry mm -hmm. and uh, it's kind of delicate at the same time it's very powerful and simple and uh, there's another guy named Randolfo I just well he's um, he also made these beautiful banners in fabric and then um, so I'm very, I'm very inspired by the whole, it's been also kind of a strong emotionally because we became kind of this collective and uh, it's been, so I'm like very into that. Um, uh, I can say I've been thinking a lot about Jonah Friedman lately uh, and I, it's a work I know, this architect I know. Mm -hmm. I got to meet him also. I, I went to, I had the luck to, to go to his place in Paris where, some years ago but recently i'm working in some commissions for a for a park in berlin where i'm developing really like kind of uh not more than a sculpture is like part of the infrastructure of infrastructure mm -hmm. of the park more like architectural works and uh so i've been a bit inspired by that and uh and i've been listening to a lot of trap from spain <laughs> ah, trap okay. music from Spain, yeah. What's the difference between the music, the trap music from Spain to say the UK? Uh, oh, well, it's completely, yeah, it's very different. It's more recent, uh, so it's more, uh, it's kind of close to reggaeton. Uh -huh. uh, it has some kind of um, Latin American vibe, like reggaeton vibe. Mm -hmm. It's It's very graphic, let's say it's very, it it uh, it talks a lot, it, and also the interesting thing is it's queer too. So mm -hmm. it's not necessarily this male discourse of like, yeah, I'm strong, and then I <laughs> I, I, yeah. I I I conquer the world, or whatever. I'm stronger than you, and I'm gonna smash you, and whatever. Mm -hmm. It's more um, there's this, this kind of level of violence also involved in the music. It's very mm -hmm. kind of hood, but at the same time uh the guys who sings or uh, they're also queer so they they are either bisexual or they, i mean they're, they're they have like not precise identities or um right. they're openly gay or trans or so right. it's a, it's a, it's i don't think the the english trap from i don't know the early 2000s mm -hmm, it's exactly. very different it's more um it's more like close to the subjects are more close to classical rap or so let me let me ask you then um in in moments of leisure, when you need to relax and recharge, what what do you do? What does Ivan Argote do <laughs> in Paris after uh, putting together these shows and and working all over the world? How do you how do you relax? Um, I mm, I stay in bed uh, like after sometimes when I do like for example after a solo show and I come home or something like that, I stay in bed like one thing a whole day, entire day. And uh, I read stuff, like sometimes I read, like, I like to read, it's a bit boring, but I read uh, like political history or things mm -hmm. like that. Also, I like to watch uh, like kind of very, I won't say trash because I love them, but like very hardcore pop, pop TV series. Like for example, lately I'm watching, when I'm very tired, I watch The Nanny. <laughs> the series from like the 90s. 80s or 90s? The Nanny? 
the nanny, yeah, the one from the nineties. Uh huh. And I, I, I actually, I, I only watch it when I was uh, like a kid. Sometimes I watch it in TV, but I was not very interested in. Is the there a difference then, between when you're watching it as a kid in Spanish and watching it now? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then actually, it's very dirty. I discovered there is a lot of uh, jokes about sex and kind of um so it's it's uh i i like that uh and it's not i not well i i it relaxes me it like takes me off mm -hmm. um we can also maybe have a wine with cheese with sofia uh mm -hmm. like what sometime we were tired and we get home so we get just open a bottle of wine and then have some cheese around and then just talk and relax mm -hmm. i I also like uh, two days ago. I had the chance to dance for the maybe first time in six months. Uh, uh, wow. We went to a friend's house and uh, we danced. And they actually, he's a he's a trained choreographer, and so that's like going to go, karaoke with a professional singer. Yeah, well, he directs <laughs> one of the biggest institutions in dance, in contemporary dance here in France. Uh, his uh, name is Noel. And uh, no, his name is Noé Soulier, yeah. and the institution is Saint-Desef, Centre National de Danse Contemporaine, like National Center of Contemporary Dance. Right. And, um, and but I mean, we don't dance, uh, uh, we don't dance contemporary dance. We okay. dance uh, Madonna, we dance reggaeton, we dance, um, yeah. <laughs> um, so Kat mm. wanted me to ask you as well about your Instagram account. About my Instagram. I'm yeah. going to show some images. We stole this. I don't okay. know, Yvonne, if you watch Hot Ones, but we definitely just stole this from them. So you're going to see some <laughs> photos from your Instagram. And if you could give us some context about sure. uh, what was happening. Mm -hmm. Ah, wow, that's nice. Uh, that was, uh, do you know, I don't know if you know the artist Gianni Motti. It's a Italian Swiss artist uh, who made this, um, uh, he made, a, uh, how do you explain? He's a conceptual artist and his work is kind of very funny. For example, he, he became famous in the late 90s because he, uh, after an earthquake, I think he was in, I think Los Angeles or something like that. He sent some images to the press, like saying like in a paper that he was the responsible for the earthquake. So he uh, he wrote to the all the ag uh, press agencies that he was the responsible for several earthquakes, solar, um, how do you say, eclipses, lunar eclipses. So he say he does that. <laughs> And uh, for example, one of them also went no words he made is like he made a soap out of the fat that was taken out from Silvio Berlusconi, the uh, back in the days president of prime minister of Italy. He the, he went to uh, Berlusconi. He went to make a liposuction uh, in a clinic, and uh, Gianni Motti recovered the fat of Berlusconi and made a soap out of that. So he's, he does this political and also kind of funny works. And one of these projects is these t-shirts that he, he gives sometimes to people that say Gianni Motti assistant. And in the early 2000s, a lot of people in riots used to wear this t-shirt and I got the chance to know Gianni and he's a good friend of mine. And so I got this t-shirt and I, I really feel it's a kind of homage because he's an interesting artist. Next. <laughs> oh, uh, the last one is nice. The last one is the, the, the one that which is very fit is the platform I show you that is installed now in the studio. And this is, uh, I think, yeah, that's the seesaw. This is the gigantic seesaw we saw before. And this is, it's a, some so common in my, in my normal life, just, uh, after you make the concrete, after you, I guess that was a day I was kind of coming back 
to work kind of physically hard in the studio. Uh, so, but that's a landscape I, I see quite often. Uh, just mixing concrete, also also working, been working so many years in construction materials. So that's that. That was that. Can we back? Can we see back in this? No. <laughs> uh, that's a lovely one. <laughs> Don't that's touch pure. the art. Don't show that to the registrars. Come on. That's radical tenderness, like in a pure in its essence, in its essence. It's um, uh, Can I ask you, I, it, we're running out of time, can I ask you one, one more thing? Yeah. Uh, what's your What's your week like? What's a normal week <laughs> for Ivana Rote? Okay, okay. So, let's say, I'm gonna tell you a week from Monday to Sunday, okay? Um, Uh, let's say on Monday, I, I wake up, uh, I, I wake up not very early, but I wake up, uh, 9 AM. They take a coffee and quite often I, I'm going to tell you this last week, for example. So um, I wake up, I get ready to come here to open the show and then to start working. And then I have to cross this square in my, in my neighborhood. And then there's this statue in the square and sometimes the statue talks to me. Uh, so for example, on Monday, I remember I was, I was crossing the square and then the statue was like, hey, Ivan. And I was like, what? Like, it's not very often that a statue talks to you, right? Um, so the statue started like, hey, Ivan, talk to me. And I'm like, I'm not talking to you. I have to go to the studio. I have to open the show just leave me alone and then I go to the studio and then I work, I open the show, this day has been very busy. And, and then for example, then this comes Tuesday. Uh, and I'm, I wake up, I take a coffee, I take a breakfast with Sofia, I leave to the studio, I try to be at 10 and I have to cross again this square. And I have to see again the status, the status again like, hey Ivan, talk to me. Um, and I was like, I don't want to talk to you. I'm in a hurry. And then I go to the studio. I made my day. Then comes Wednesday. And uh, the same. Take the same breakfast, banana and a coffee. I leave. And then I have to cross the stage again. And the statue is telling me, it's high statue, big on a pedestal. And it's yelling at me like, hey, Juan, please talk to me. And I was like, I don't want to talk to you. Why? And then it happens to me again on Thursday. I, every time I cross this square, this statue is calling me all the time and I start feeling paranoid. You're right, I don't normally talk to statues, you know? It's not something that's normal in everyone's day, kind of day. And then Friday, Friday, I was very tired. Long week. Um, been dealing with a lot of visits. We had interviews, we had many things. Talking about this project is, This, this exhibition that talks also about the political situation in Brazil, the, with this, the past of slavery, the actual things that are like, for example, the forest, the Amazonian forest burning down. And then I go with all these things in my hand and cross the statue again. The statue is like, hey, Ivan, come on. And more aggressively, just talk to me. I'm here. I'm always here. I need to talk to you. And I get more and more pissed. And um, then it comes, uh, and I did, I told her, you know what? I don't want to talk to you now. Maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow. Okay, then it's Saturday. I normally don't go to the studio on Saturday, but I had to, I had to go because we're having this thing. And, uh, and then I, I'm very pissed. Um, and... Uh, I crossed the square and the statue stopped him and saying like, Ivan, you told me you would talk to me today. And I was like, you know what? Okay, I'm going to talk to you. So I went in front of the statue and I was like, why are you there? Why well, I have to see you every day there? You're offensive. Every time I see you, you talk to me so directly. You remind me of a history I dislike. I'm responsible. I have to carry It's part of my history, part of our history, but I don't think you deserve to be out there. I don't think you represent 
what we feel, what I feel, what my friends feel, what people like me feel. I think you're aggressing me all the day. Every time I cross the square, every time I have to see you, every time I cross, you're yelling at me. You're yelling at me a, a set of values that I really don't like, that I really try to fight. Um, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not like that. I'm a nice guy, but I don't think you should be there. I think you should, we should be allowed, me and all of us, to transform you because it's pointless. What you do there, up there, yelling to everybody around that you are there, that of your importance, just telling and be happy about your own importance, your greatness. It's offensive. So please leave me alone. And then it comes Sunday. And in Sunday, I try not to cross the square to avoid that conversation. And then comes Monday. And on Monday, I take a coffee. I eat a banana. I try to get a studio at 10. And I cross the square. And I see this tattoo trying to talk to me. And I try to ignore it. So that's basically how I spent the week. <laughs> Thank you, Ilan. <laughs> Can you bring up an image of one of his interventions with the monument? Do you have that? No? Okay. Um, so I think, you know, it went by so quickly. Uh, <laughs> you want to open know. it up to some questions? Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. If there is um, some questions, I'll be, I'll be delighted to answer so feel free everybody to unmute yourself um let us see your beautiful faces you know on this sunday <laughs> or you can type your questions in the chat and we'll relay them to yvonne any questions oh, i have a question um my name's Jasmine. Um, hello. I'm curious, Hi. so with this statue, um, what is it of? <laughs> uh, actually, uh, I, I <laughs> no, that's, it's more of like a metaphor, actually. I don't live near a square, and, but it's more like uh, I wanted to make uh, this, uh, uh, this idea of this um, monument and some historical things that are always present and consistent like they're always there and then you have to live with them and then you have to you have to actually sometimes you even ignore it because you don't i mean you don't have the time even to check them but it's uh it's a bit oppressive so i wanted just to make it sort of the music uh, i was playing it was made by um julio and then we wanted to make this sort of performance and i, I wanted to put that out uh, to to say like how sometimes uh history is always there always present and we can't uh, just do anything about it. Uh, and then sometimes I think we have the right to go out and then tell these monuments, tell this kind of, not only monuments, but different kind of things. Sometimes it's a law, sometimes it's a policy to, uh, that we don't, we don't, we're tired of them. <laughs> All right. No, that makes that makes sense. Um, awesome. Thanks for answering. I didn't realize that it was a metaphor, but I like that because I think that it's applicable <laughs> to so many things. Yeah, I'm not. I mean, I I'm sometimes uh, I do crazy stuff, but I don't I don't <laughs> talk. Uh, status doesn't talk to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you for your time. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Hey, Yvonne, this is Gregory. I, uh, I yeah. teach in Arizona in the, in the School of Art, and I just wanted to start out by thanking you for the work you do and <laughs> Thank how, you. how it sort of influenced and really connected with my university students. Um, uh, you might remember some of them danced with one of your videos. Oh, you uh, yeah, 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 of course, of course. That was and, a big moment for me. <laughs> and. Um, so I just wanted to say that you're having an impact and it was wonderful. Wow. And, and one of the things that I really appreciated and it was like how to bring sort of conceptual thinking into their bodies and into our bodies. And, um, I, and that's sort of the basis a little bit of, of this question that's not yeah. really formed 
that I have around this, this sort of radical tenderness. And I want to invite you to speak more about that in the way in which the politic and the, the sort of emotion and the embodiment yeah. all come together. And I just, I'd like to hear more from you. Uh, you know, I think sure, about um, licking that pole in the subway. <laughs> put yourself right uh, now. Um, so, um, I, I'm glad you, uh, thank you, thank you, really, thank you, and, and I'm so glad also the students can see dance, and then what you said, is, it's really flattering, and um, it's beautiful to see that your ideas kind of generate others' ideas, and so about that question, um, and then what something you said inside the question was this idea of um, how the conceptual work can join the body, and then I would say, I would compliment that is like I I always been curious or I question myself this idea of like make a difference in between the feelings and the thinking uh, because I think uh, it's a kind of um, maybe in the Western society is something we made the difference of very kind of this is thinking this is kind of intellectual work and this is feelings and. And I, I don't think this different, this, this limit really exists. I think we are a single body that generates a lot of uh, both feelings and thinking. And I don't think you cannot, you can separate them in the way, like uh, in the way we do a conversation, for example, or in the way it's, uh, we're involved with our body, we're involved with our brain, we're involved with our past emotions. Um, so I think there is a an always connection that to sometimes to try to separate and to we try to generate this this idea of knowledge that uh, as something kind of pure and abstract. I, I I think we have to deconstruct that and then realize that everything we know passed through uh, just emotions and feelings and sensations. Uh, so that's the first part of it. Um, and I think I try to also do that with my work. Uh, I try to generate uh, opinions about political, historical issues, but not necessarily using this sphere of uh, uh, only thinking or knowledge, or but just making a mix in between how we live them. I'm really one of these artists that it's a big tradition in the arts that who believes like art needs to be close to life and life which we have should be closer to art. <laughs> Um, that's why I also work with kids because I think it's important to, uh, to, to, to make, uh, that experience. Like, for example, in the, in an upcoming show, I was supposed to have at this show, it's in a museum, uh, Kunstverein in, in Germany, in Dusseldorf, no, in Dortmund. Um, I was supposed to do a show in November this year, but because of COVID and everything, we moved it to May and then the show was supposed to talk about public space and many either interventions I made in the past and some maybe sculptures I would do like on site. And after we did discussing with the curator, Rebecca, um, we were like, okay, I mean, the show could be interesting show, but why after all this, maybe we need to do something that kind of, mat not, is that not matters, but maybe affects more uh, the context uh, in a more alive and we decided for the, uh, like, as I tell you, this workshop with kids, I've been doing it parallel to my work and my shows. And, and I decided, I told her, you know what? I've been dreaming to have a museum as a school for a period of time, uh, to use the museum as a class place where you don't do the same things you do at school, but you do other things. So we decided to just have the museum only and only do these workshops for uh, like three times per week for example with different schools with kids they inscribe themselves maybe make develop these workshops into another kind of workshop and use the museum as a host for um like a pedagogical project um experimental uh, kind of very free uh funny uh so yeah that would be my answer and then mm -hmm. It's um, about this, the tenderness idea. I think it's everywhere. It's, it, it has to do with this idea of like, be connected with your emotions and then with, without being ashamed or without being, uh, sometimes, you know, like uh, contact. I like, believe a lot in contact and then physical contact these days is kind of difficult, but like also, that's why also I do these bridges, you know, because the bridge is a place that could be touched two spaces 
it's a place where you can join, where you can kiss. <laughs> um, so I, I'm like trying not to be afraid to to assume that as serious as as a kind of a more like conceptual thinking. Thank you. Thanks, Gregory, for that question. There's one <laughs> more in the chat from Tanya. Uh, uh, where have you spent the most amount of time in the United States? Um, I lived in New York uh, a year and a half in 2010 and 11. So if I accumulate the days, I think New York would be the place. Um, but I traveled a lot to the um, West Coast because of the desert project I made uh, with Desert X. Mm -hmm. X um, and so I kept all the uh, all 2018 going. I went so many times, and I spent months, actually entire months, doing either research or doing uh, working physically constructing the, the installation. Then when I went to Phoenix, also it's my kind of my last my last trips uh, to the United mm -hmm. States was actually Phoenix. Uh, and uh, I actually, I know I had a residency once in 2013 in LA also. I made 18th Street, uh, the residency at with 18th Pilar. Street at the time with Pilar, yeah. Something Rivers. That was back in, that's how I met Pilar. Then with Pilar, we've been, she's been, I mean, we've been working together since then. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's the most of spaces, places I've been in New York, LA, uh, uh, and a bit so of what, just, huh? What do you miss the most, or what do you miss? Uh, not of course, Phoenix. Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I miss. I feel. I feel very good in the United States. It's. A, it's a very different experience. Every city is a very different experience. Um, uh, I have to say, like uh, since like the New York life, my New York life was back in. Mm -hmm. It's almost ten years ago. I feel closer <laughs> now to the West Coast. Um, and somehow I got to discover a bit more being outside the city, eating the desert, being uh, to Grand Canyon, to Sedona, to all these beautiful places. And I miss, I miss a bit, I miss that. I miss the um, traveling. Uh, it's, uh, it's really amazing. It's something you can see elsewhere. Uh, I miss Mexican food. <laughs> hey, Ivan. Hey. Who's that? Who's it's this? now. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hi, Julio and Hi. Ivan. How are you? How are you? I'm, I'm great. I wanted you to give us all some inspiration to keep making work right now. It <laughs> seems like you guys are a little further along than we are, and it's really hard mm. to keep going. I know, I know. Mm. How do you do it's, it? Uh, well, things, uh, we had a very strong period in March, April, May, and after May, uh, we kind of, everything kind of retake slowly um, here. So we have a lot of attention and like to take care. Most of my shows were moved to 2021, 22. Um, and then, uh, well, I, I always, I mean, I'm an artist who reacts to reality in different ways. I don't react to news, let's say, or, but I kind of, so I'm constantly doing things and I'm kind of hyperactive and in that way. So I never stop. For example, lately I'm, I'm working on my fear feature film, which is, a, it's a long story, but it's like more, uh, it's based on uh, some characters of my family, a guy who was a military guy in the 50s and he became a kind of radical, uh, super right-wing um, uh, politician and he started doing like neo-Nazi movements. It, it, it's my, it was the brother of my grandmother and he became also this politician but, but he was at the same time very generous and funny and, and uh, I got to meet him. He died when I was about 15. And uh, he also kind of raised my mother and my mother when I realized lately that I've been working on this project for 10 years. So I had the time to work a lot on that. But then to resume the story, my mother, uh, who was kind of the first uh, of her generation, she was, and ah, my uncle was also homosexual. And he had this crazy sexual life with young soldiers, young bullfighters, and he was kind of hidden. Um, so he never married and my mother was, uh, he mentored her. But my, my mother was 18 years old. He became, uh, he entered into a extreme le leftist guerrilla. 
So, but they came loving each other. So they were like confronting their political ideas because he was radically on the right, like fascist. He was really uh, kind of a Nazi. And then um, uh, my mother was this super communist, uh, but we had like, we still had like family reunions and then sometimes conflicts. But, and the film talks about that. And at the end of the film, it talks about like, how kind of love is the only way you can like conciliate and make these two people to to, to live together. Um, so I had the time to work on that. <laughs> and, uh, but then also I have to take care of the studio because we're a group of three, four, five people. And then uh, for that, I've been lucky. Uh, and then we've been working a lot in public commissions like public sculpture and stuff. something I really love to, to do. So that's what keep me busy. Now I made up this space to host a Latin American artist. So, and it's actually working. We have a lot of press and I think we can continue. It's, it's actually growing. So the idea is to continue to not only work on my own project, but maybe host and try to show like some of the richness of the Latin America art scene here in France that actually don't, you don't have the chance to see it much. Mm -hmm. So I am I'm, I'm keep busy or just making up all these projects all the time. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. You guys are awesome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Thank you. So we reached um, 11.05 in Phoenix time. And so I really want to thank you, Yvonne, for taking the time to to oh, thank you. with us again. We really so appreciate we... you. We love you. We, we <laughs> are so happy we acquired some of your work for our collection. Mm, 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 mm. So I just want to I'm say very honored for that. Gracias. No, gracias no. a ustedes. And really feel close and like a family also. Then can't wait till we can see each other again because I miss to talk and, and your delicious food and seeing your beautiful family and, <laughs> and share, share time with you, Julio, and with you guys in Phoenix, really. I wish I wish I could we could do it hopefully soon. Gracias, Iván. No, gracias a ti. Gracias a ustedes. Chao. Chao, besitos. <laughs>